All right, we're going to get going here. Um, so for those of you who have uh, joined us today, uh, thank you for coming um, and, and welcome to the AGU Chorus Forum on how open is open data and software. Today is our first Chorus Forum for this year. It's being co-hosted with our colleagues from the American Geophysical Union. Our two organizations came together for today's event to promote the growing importance of this forum's topic. Today's forum of hopefully over 160 registrants would not be possible without the generous sponsorship coming from ACM, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, Silverchair, and STM. So a little bit about Chorus. We are a community effort dedicated to making open research work. Our goals are to help our main stakeholders of publishers, institutions, and funders scale their OA compliance. We work to develop metrics about open data, improve the overall quality of their metadata relating to open research, and host forums and workshops like today's forum to connect the stakeholders so they can learn and hopefully build trust with each other. As our speakers present today, feel free to use Zoom's QA feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask your questions. They will either be answered by the speakers live or in the QA window. Also, feel free to upvote questions that you think are important so we're sure to get to them. Today's forum will run until 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and will also be recorded for later viewing. We have two excellent sessions lined up for you. Session one is what is the value of open data software sharing in a world of open science, the researcher perspective, which will be moderated by Christina Frauwet Ben Welder. Um, this will be followed by a short break, including an interactive poll. Then we'll get on to session two, highlighting what is the value of open data software sharing in a world of open science, the support system moderated by Shelley Stahl. So, Without any further ado, over to you, Christina. Thanks so much, Howard. Uh, we're really excited to be here today. And thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Christina Braunfelder. I'm Program Manager of Open Science at the American Geophysical Union. And I'm really excited to bring to you today three speakers who are themselves researchers, as well as practitioners of open science, and to bring you a discussion on just what openness means to the researcher. Open science practices can be transformative and remove barriers to sharing science, increasing reproducibility and transparency. But the paths towards incorporating these open science practices in research aren't always obvious or easy, and the range of new concepts, approaches, and tools that the researcher is presented with can be complex and overwhelming. During our work promoting open science leadership at the American Geophysical Union, Shelley Stahl and I have seen a number of different researchers' journeys towards more open practices in their own work and a range of starting points and different paths and different goals that these journeys can encompass. So in this forum, following up on a town hall that we hosted uh, last year at AGU's 2022 meeting, we hope to continue a discussion about pathways to open for researchers and the forms that openness can take in research, encompassing a range of steps towards openness. Now I'm honored to introduce to you these three researchers and open science practitioners to hear from them about this journey. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Kathleen Gregory at the University of Vienna, where she researches data practices, including data management and curation, and how people manage, discover, make sense of, and reuse research data in academia and public life. Kathleen holds a PhD in science and technology studies, as well as degrees in neuroscience, education, and library and information science. After Kathleen, we'll hear from Mumin Oladipo of the Department of Physics at Kola Daisi University, and a member of the Nigeria Geophysical Society. His research interests include communication physics, space weather, meteorology, and home automation. And he also manages the KDU VLF receiving station. Oladipo is a physicist by training as well as a qualified teacher. Uh, and finally, we'll hear from Dr. Elise Zipkin of the Department of Integrative Biology at Michigan State University, where she leads a research team developing analytical frameworks to address grand challenges in the study of biodiversity loss and the effects of anthropogenic activities. Elise holds a doctoral degree in biology, as well as degrees in natural resources, math, and applied ecology. Uh, without further ado, over to you, Kathleen. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Christina, for the introduction. Yeah, as Christina said, uh, I'm maybe in a bit of a unique position as my research actually is in to investigate practices of open science. So I have more of the meta researcher perspective in today's panel. Uh, next, Howard. 
Yeah, so today in my 10 minutes that I have with you today, I am going to briefly take up three questions that were presented to us in the original abstract for the panel and the forum today. Um, I'll give kind of three initial responses and some thoughts on those questions, which I call provocations here. And then I'll also try to think about um, what practical steps can be done in response to these, these questions and these provocations as we all work to encourage and monitor and support uh, open data in particular. Next. So the first provocation that I'd like to engage with is to consider the question if openness um, is something that is binary, if something can be open or closed, or if openness is rather dependent on context and as such really demands more flexible approaches. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a question which I and maybe many of you here don't have to consider for too long. Uh, as research has really repeatedly shown that openness does depend on a researcher's context and that this is true even within the same disciplinary domain and research community. Uh, community. Uh, next slide, please. So we see this when we uh, look at research on, for example, practices of data sharing. Um, which depend on different community norms, different legal restrictions, different types of data that someone is working with. So this quote is from an interview study that we conducted a few years ago. And we saw that this biomedical researchers uh, data sharing practices were very different depending on the type of data that they were using, which lab they were working in, which country they were in at the moment, uh, whether they were in clinical or research settings. Uh, next slide, please. So this kind of contextual dependency is also present for um, reusing data. So this chart, which is a little bit blurry, but I'll explain, is from a recent survey that we conducted um, at the Meaningful Data Counts Project, which is uh, part of a work that we're doing at the Scholarly Communications Lab in Canada. So on this survey, we uh, had about 2,500 respondents from researchers. And 466 of those said that they do not actually reuse data. So we were really curious to learn more about their reasons for why not. And the two items that are highlighted with the orange arrow say that uh, at a level of the overall number of respondents to this question without looking at significant disciplinary differences, which are indicated in purple here, but at the level of the entire sample for this question, um, reusing data was something that was not relevant for their research methods, or was not something that was normal in their research community for the people who actually selected that they don't reuse data. But there are also challenges uh, that may prevent people from reusing data. For example, they can't find the data that they need, they don't get as much credit for reusing data as they do for creating data, or they don't even know that that's an option. Uh, next slide, please. But just because something is complex and contextual depend, contextually dependent as opening data is, as all data practices are, it doesn't mean that we can't do nothing, that we shouldn't try to do something. Uh, I think it does require, however, that we think about things a little bit differently. So for example, rather than having just single broad policies that govern data management or govern open science, we need to think about policies that can be more flexible. Maybe we have a broad policy, for example, that outlines core tenets of what's important in open science. And then individual research communities can figure out what that looks like in their practice. And then this kind of snaps into this broader policy. I also think it's important to remember that not all data can be open. Not everyone will be a data reuser. Um, but that these other ways of conducting research that don't involve reusing data, for example, are still important, they're still valuable, and we still need to engage with researchers in these communities as we continue to design um, guidelines and policies for open science and open data. Uh, next slide, please. So this brings me to the second question or the second provocation that I'd like to think about together today. And this is the question of what our responsibility is when we attribute and credit uh, data that are reused. Uh, next slide. And here I want to wait a little bit, so I don't answer so readily, because I wonder what are people already actually doing in this space? Are researchers already responsibly attributing data when they reuse them? Uh, next slide. And this is from the same survey that I mentioned before, 
We were really quite surprised when the majority of the 2,000 people who reuse data in the survey indicated that they actually do cite data when they reuse data. Um, but what we also see here is that there is a great variety in how they do so. So they're not always citing the data themselves. Maybe this is not a surprise for everybody, but they're off more often citing an article or publication in which the data are analyzed or the source of the data. But again, I don't think that this variety means that researchers are acting irresponsibly. I think that it's quite likely they're acting responsibly, um, ethically, according to the norms of their own own communities and their own practices and their own and their own disciplines. Uh, next slide, please, Howard. And this is maybe reflected in this response to this next question that we asked for people who do cite data. We wanted to know why they do so. And we see at a very high level, again, across the, the sample here, um, that the reasons which were selected often for citing data reflect kind of ideal research practices, such as showing intellectual debt or helping others to locate and access data or indicating some type of use. Um, next slide, please. So what practical steps can be done here in this space of thinking about data attribution, and data citation? Well, I think it's very important that we continue to encourage uh, standardized ways of citing data. For example, in a reference list, as this really does aid discovery and traceability of data reuse. But I also think it's important to think about what practices researchers are actually engaging in um, and consider when we can actually adapt our own guidelines and our own policies to match the practices of the researchers who we are actually supporting. For example, in the humanities, where more researchers tend to use footnotes to cite data, and this is a practice that we found uh, is tied to long-standing <laughs> ways of citing and referencing um, different types of things also, not just data. Uh, next slide, please, Howard. So that brings me to my third and final uh, question that I'd like to engage with here. And that's the kind of the question of the overall panel itself. And that's to think about what the value is of open data, um, which I rephrased a little bit here. Next slide, please. And this answer is perhaps not <laughs> what we might expect at first, because we often hear this argument in support of open data, that data sharing and reuse will accelerate the speed of science and make things more efficient and save time and money. Um, but to me, and here I speak more from my own experience as someone who practices open science, I think one of the real values in data management planning and in sharing data openly is that it forces us, if you do it well, it forces us to slow down and it provides an opportunity to really think about the choices that we are making in research and with our own data. Uh, next slide, please, Howard. And this involves, for example, having conversations um, within a team as we do within the Meaningful Data Counts project, where we really document and share all of our outputs from our research data management plan to our preprints to our, to our data sets. But these conversations that we have about data management are not the most exciting of conversations. They are detailed conversations about how to code variables and how to name things and which types of formats to use. Um, but they also provide a way for us to check in on our own practices and with each other to make sure that we're in agreement uh, with what we're doing and to think about how that matches what we originally started to do and set out to do in this project. Um, and if our practices, for whatever reason, don't actually match what we said they were going to be in our research data management plan, that gives us an opportunity again to either change our practices or to change the research data management plan to better reflect reflect our own research and the own um, our own data and what's unique about it that's different from what we originally envisioned. Uh, next slide, please, Howard. So this, I think, is really what provides a real value to research here. But when we think about how to support it and how to evaluate this type of work, um, it's a little bit tricky. And it's also a little bit tricky because this takes time and resources and effort to do well in a research environment that is kind of short on all of those things where we don't have a lot of time and we don't have a lot of resources. We also want to not get into a situation where a well-intentioned goal or a well-intentioned tool like a data management plan um, becomes more of an administrative burden than something that's actually helpful. Something that provides a way for us to you know, check in and have conversations about our research, 
rather than just being a, a checkbox on a grant application or something I need to include in an ethical review application in order to conduct my interview study that I needed to have done yesterday. Uh, so what that looks like in practice, I think, is open for discussion, and I look forward to taking that up with you in the Q&A. Maybe it is encouraging different data management plan versionings. Maybe it uh, involves asking different types of reporting questions when we report on the funded projects that we are involved in. I'd be curious to hear your ideas as well. Um, so with that, that's the end. Thank you. You can go to the next slide or not. I enjoyed looking at those three questions and kind of some of my ideas on them with you. And I look forward to the questions. I pass it back to you, Christina. Thank you, Kathleen. That was really great. And I already have a lot of questions for you. Uh, I will hold them until the end. Is that right, Tara? And we will move on to Oladipo's presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Good afternoon here. Yeah. My name is Oladipo Mumin Olatunji. Um, I'm a lecturer at uh, Paradise University, Ibado. Um, the title of my presentation, Benefit of uh, Open Data and um, Software Sharing in Open Science. I am a great beneficiary of open science, and I will be discussing some of uh, the benefits of open science, uh, open data and software. Um, and we also uh, just highlight a few softwares and data, uh, open data and software that I've uh, benefited from. And I also, I also share um, some of the community services that uh, emanated from some of uh, these uh, resources that I have benefited from and uh, some of the challenges that we have uh, that, that uh, uh, open data and open software is facing and why, uh, which is impending it from progress from my own perspective. So first, next slide, please. So what is um, open data uh, and software? Open data and software are publicly available data and software that can be universally or readily accessed, used, or distributed free of charge. Uh, open science uh, is the practice of science in which uh, in such a way that others can collaborate, contribute, where research data, research data laboratory nodes, other research processes are freely available under terms that, are, that enable it to be reduced, redistributed, um, reproduced, uh, in, uh, 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 and reproduced. Next slide, please. Next um, slide, please. Now. What are the need for open data and software? Number one, it, it improves um, accessibility. Op uh, also, it creates opportunities. Now, think about it, especially from the perspective of um, those of us who are researchers in the developing countries. Yeah, we, without uh, access to um, certain information, it is difficult for us to be able to contribute our own um, quota into the development of of uh, human race. For example, for some of us uh, who are in the nature of um, space science, it's impossible for us to be able to, uh, um, for, for a number of us in the developing country, our space program is still in the infancy. And uh, data that we need to be able to uh, use to us to have an insight of what is happening in the space uh, and also do research related to that, we wouldn't have been possible if we don't have uh, data, uh, open data and open softwares that uh, can enable us to, within our own sphere, be able to make contributions. So open data and software create opportunities. Also, it reduces corruption. Now, researchers that, that knows, uh, understand that their data is readily available uh, for the public. Uh, literally, this gives a sense of uh, accountability and uh, reduces the chances of people manipulating results. And uh, it also enhances the credibility of, um, of research that are available and uh, ensure that narratives are not, uh, false narratives are not being uh, pushed into the public. Also, that also implies that it increases accountability um, and transparency. 
and provide also uh, open data and software provide uh, a fair playing ground for uh, and equal opportunities for all. Then, uh, which uh, again uh, gives importance to some to the work that uh, Coros is doing and uh, the need for open data, truly and open software. Next slide, please. Now, benefit of open open data and software uh, and introspection from my own perspective. Um, basically, I research in um, space science, uh, metrology, and uh, uh, and uh, embedded system and electronics, then uh, solar and uh, renewable energy. So I have greatly benefited from the World Data Center, which provide uh, more than 80% of the data that I use for my analysis and um, for my for my public for my research work. Yeah, it's a uh, it's, uh, it's it's a good thing that we have such platform sharing data and making it available for people who wouldn't have had such opportunities to be able to to be contributing making contributions no matter how little to to be able to uh, the knowledge and the knowledge base that we have. Also, I've, I've benefited from Python, and uh, most of my research uh, uh, analysis, uh, I, uh, also um, uh, most of my research and data visualization, and also instrument some instrument uh, instrumentation that I'm using correctly, are uh, actually built with Python, and uh, also Arduino is uh, also an open source that has greatly influenced my. Uh, my my career, we, we, I use that for my for also my instrumentation, and also we do um, give. I do give back to the society, like uh, for some of the instrumentations that we've made, which are the VLF uh, receiver that we built, we are able to distribute it around and get it installed in uh, locations around Nigeria. Also, the plug the uh, instrument, the, the, the some of the Arduino works that project that we do. We, we train secondary school students and do exhibition. We allow them to do exhibition. We did produce a uh, small, small pro basic projects like uh, that ranges from robotics to imaging to uh, home automation. And this is a way of, uh, of bringing up the, the younger generation to be able to spark their interest in sciences. And I, I don't think this would have been possible if we don't have all of this uh, softwares and data being open and available for some, some of us who are in the developing country to be able to use and develop ourselves and also make impact within our society and our community. Next slide, please. Now, here are some of the challenges that I have identified in, the, in open science. Number one, inadequate infrastructure. Number two, the readiness on the part of the society to be able to use such platform. Example is uh, the issue that uh, the previous speaker talked about in reusing data. Of course, some people don't even think it's uh, it's uh, it's necessary to us to reuse some uh, data that have already been used, maybe for another set of research, something like that. You provide uh, infrastructure for that is openly available. And after spending resources, people are not using it. Yeah, it's, it's a major challenge. Also, research that are publicly funded especially those that has to do with national security. It is uh, very challenging to have to uh, get the government to give us, even if there is, even if some of the aspect of that uh, research is usable for civilian use, uh, it's difficult to be able to get the government to do that because of course, uh, security of, uh, of the nation is a very important thing. For, for the government. Also, corporate funded uh, research. I've noticed some of the contracts in them in the restrict us uh, the use of the distribution and the use of, uh, of, of research. In fact, some, sometimes it's, it's so bad that, uh, in, for, in the academic perspective, anyway, that uh, those, especially the early career who participate in such research, cannot even uh, present such, uh, uh, such uh, research to the, to the faculty within the department. And uh, lastly, uh, open access publication fee. And this, uh, this last part is actually a, a part where one can actually ask the big question. Is open access truly open? Because now uh, you look at it, someone is to, to, able, to be able to put a, uh, the result of, 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 of a research out into the public. 
someone has to pay for it. And it becomes even more uh, worrisome if the people who have uh, done the research are from the community where there is uh, little, there is no funding, and they have to, they are funding their research from their post, and uh, they, they cannot even afford to be able to pay their uh, publication fee. So some of this, can talk some of these are challenges that I, I, I believe are impending the uh, uh, are impending open data and open software. And I think uh, for the last point that I've made, Corvus is trying to find a way a guideline and a framework and a framework and advisory to be able to go through it with a, such that um, um, the, the, the publication outlets are able to remain in business while academics are also able to find a way of uh, assessing the uh, open access uh, platform. Next slide, please. Now, the, the impact of open access and software uh, in, in, in science research, number one, it creates opportunities. It's also, it empowers scientists because when scientists uh, publish their work in open science, op uh, as open source, people are able to see the work, they're able to use the work, and also, um, uh, that implies more citation for the scientists, which increase, uh, increases the uh, reputation of such scientists. Of course, it helps solve human problems and expand the knowledge base and provide new insights. Of course, when, when more people are able to look at the same data over and over again, they get, we have more insights from that kind of data. And uh, more, if, if it's, for example, data related to, uh, to, to, to space science, we have, what we want to do is to provide models for prediction and uh, it's, it's, we are able to get better models because more people are coming up with models and we are able to get uh, uh, better models to be able to advance our knowledge and understanding of uh, such a human endeavor. And it also creates new opportunities. Next slide, please. So conclusively, the world is a global village and we are all connected and the impact of our actions and inactions affect each other. The human race is faced with a lot of challenges that needs to be tackled together. Some of these challenges are existential threats, hence the need to collect for a collective effort. Open data and software should be encouraged in science and also in all uh, field of uh, knowledge to allow everyone to contribute towards uh, building a better future for human race. Thanks for listening. Yeah, the last slide. Yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Aladipo. And it's really uh, great to hear stories of the benefits that open science can have in practicing research as well. Uh, so I think our last speaker, Elise, uh, we're excited to hear from you. And then we'll be opening the floor to discussion with all three of our speakers. Hi, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I don't have any slides. I just wanted to um, give a little bit of a perspective on how my lab um, deals with open science. And really, I wanted to thank my colleagues who came before me because I think they set the stage up very well and um, addressing the different issues with open science and how researchers uh, deal with that. So my research focuses on estimating the abundance and distributions of species and how that changes with big structures big things like anthropogenic change, climate change on big scales. And so right away, we can see that this kind of research has moved from experimental stuff where one researcher could collect their own data and um, you know do analyses on that to something much more global. So now, you know, the kinds of questions we're asking are, how are migratory species that might make continental migrations being impacted by climate change? How are communities of species going to be able to, um, you know, build resilience to really big changing global environmental conditions? So one of the huge, I think, benefits of um, open data and open science in general has been that it's been able to allow us to answer, to look at those kinds of questions. Because the kinds of data that people now need to collect, um, you know, I think to address these really big grand challenges in, um, you know, in biodiversity science, in the effects of climate change, other kinds of all other types of environmental science really can't be collected by a single uh, researcher or a network of researchers even. So we rely so much more on, um, you know, the big federal open science programs, citizen science programs, and also, um, you know, the uh, ability of other researchers to make their data open and available. Um, so I really do think that one of kind of the biggest 
the biggest, most important things about open data is that it allows us, it's going to allow us to continue to ask and answer questions that are just unanswerable, I think, using individual data sets or using, um, you know, pieces of what, or collecting your own data pieces of what could be out there. So I really want to highlight that, that to the new kinds of questions that we're asking in science, open science really is going to be the only way we're going to be able to answer them. And then I wanted to think about a little bit, like, what are some of those challenges? And I'll, and I'll talk to you about that through kind of the development of my lab. So we develop, a lot of what we do is develop these math models and statistical models that we try and make available to the public. Um, so we're really, really into open science. We have a whole um, uh, repository, a code and data repository, where we have a complete process by which we, you know, kind of clean our code, clean our data, and put... Um, that information up there in a way that is accessible because I really liked what Kathleen said you know about is data open or not and it's really really not binary I mean if you think about it it's pretty easy for people to kind of publish their data in ways that are really unusable by other scientists so I think um you know that's one step that we need to be thinking a lot you know as basically scientists scientists researchers and also um the journals and funders um it's easy to publish data that is not really usable or code that is not really usable so we think a lot about okay how do we make what we do actually reproducible and actually usable um for other people down the road and then a second thing that i really like that kathleen said i think that's relevant is this idea of yes, there is this thing that it helps that open data and, and open science helps move science forward, but it does actually also help you reflect and um, kind of make sure you're doing right. So I think a lot through this process, you know, when when we know our data is going to be um, and our data and our code is going to be made public, um, it does give us a, a pause where we can stop and think about. Um, double checking each thing that we're doing, each step of what we're doing and catching mistakes. And, and I would say that we have found, uh, you know, as, in my lab, mistakes through this approach. As we're really thinking about cleaning up our analyses to make them accessible to someone else, it allows us to reflect back on it and make sure that we've made the best choices with our different analyses and, you know, allows us to double check all kinds of mistakes. So I think that's another um huge benefit of it. Um, and then I just kind of wanted to also highlight this one piece that, you know, so it's it's always a process, right? There's no like easy way. How do you make data open? How do you make code a software open? It, it's this continually iterative process. You know, we've developed um, policies by which we do this. You know, we have a whole guidelines on how to do it. And yet we always need to have this conversation and update it um, because new things come up and those are constantly being, you know, that, that's constantly forcing us to change how we're doing things. And so I think that's one one piece that's worth continually thinking about. It's it's not just an easy do it this way if we want to make our data accessible in a way that is really reproducible. And then the other thing is we're constantly having this conversation, you know, with new students who come into the lab, which is, you know, the fear associated with it. Because of course, if you put your your data and your research, your code all up on a website or you make it accessible, you make it um, available, it is much easier for someone to find a mistake in what you've done. And I think we're moving towards this place where that's okay, it's okay. You can have mistakes in what you do and we can find those mistakes and that, that and unless, you know, these are malicious, kind of fraudulent, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, we don't necessarily need to retract papers. We don't need to, um, you know, vilify people. I think that's been done in the past with mistakes. And mistakes are okay. They happen. And as long as we're transparent about that, um, you know, we can continue to produce the best science into the future. Um, so really, that's kind of how my my lab thinks about this and, you know, the process by which we're always sort of updating and uh, continually trying to approach this in ways that are that are better um, and that are more accessible to researchers and the public. Um, and I do think that, you know, as we continue thinking about how to make data open um, and why it's valuable, we need to just keep updating the process and know that it's something regularly that we have to think about and work on. Thanks so much, Elise. I think you really highlighted that this is uh, not just, you know, sharing data and software. This is a question of of cultural change across research that that will enable us to feel more comfortable being open. Uh, and I think that's a really important consideration here. Uh, 
I, th I think we now have time for a bit of discussion and question and answer with the audience. And I want to go back to something that you said, um, Kathleen, about uh, flexibility, the flexibility overall to meet the researcher where they are in, in their process of sharing data. And I want to ask a question that, that selfishly it relates to professional society, since I work at one. Uh, what do you think the role of a professional society like American Geophysical Union, which does publish papers as well as run meetings and, and work as a professional society, has in sort of uh, making sure that we keep this flexibility inherent in our processes while still having guidelines for researchers? Yeah, thanks, Christina. I mean, I think that's that's a really big question and it is an important one, right? And I think that uh, professional associations are not the only people who are needing to answer that question. I think that's a question that universities need to address. I think that's a question that uh, publishers are probably also thinking of. Um, so yeah, the question is, how do you have a policy that holds people accountable while also having flexibility to meet people where they are, right? And I really think that it involves involving the people themselves in developing the policy and in getting buy-in and not doing it as a one-off thing hello, we're developing a data management policy and we want you to make all of your data available. Please sign our petition. But doing something that's more iterative. I mean, maybe at every meeting you have a session on open data uh, or open software and every meeting you invite people to come and like this, you invite people from different perspectives and have some time for actual debate um, to make your process of policy development a little bit more transparent. And I say you, right, because you framed the question in terms of the AGU. But of course, this, this goes for any development of policy. But just like with opening data, it will slow the process down, right? Uh, this type of engagement is not a fast thing. But I think in the long run, it is a more sustainable way forward as we try to move toward a, a change in culture. Um, and even not necessarily cultural change, but just moving towards uh, meeting people where they are and, and recognizing where they are in this different stage um, of, of the open science process. I think that's a good point, Kathleen, about the process being slow. Uh, and specifically for the researcher, I think that often this is seen as another, uh, you know, for instance, we have a data and software sharing policy at the HEU. Um, and we have a lot of really, really supportive researchers, but we also recognize that it takes more time and effort to do this than it does to just, you know, publish your paper and not share your data and software. Uh, and time is something that researchers don't have very much of. Uh, can any of you share any strategies here? Do you feel that, uh, you know, maybe once you have a process, it becomes very efficient for you to share your data and software, or is it always a challenge? And how can we keep that in mind uh, with the, you know, publisher parish mindset? Then I'll jump in at once with tips and, and helpful <laughs> advice. <laughs> oh, well, I didn't, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I actually think it, it focuses on both things, which is we have to meet each person where they are on this, but also we have to have policies that we can develop so that people can go along. So in my lab, you know, like I said, we've been developing documents where we try and help each person, you know, who's leading the project along to know, you know, at the you know, at the onset, we know everything you're going to do is going to be made um, public. So that at least allows the person to know in advance, they're going to have to be thinking about that the whole way through. So the best way I would say in the context of publication is to be doing it the entire process through when you're building your code, when you're cleaning your data, you know, that you're commenting it and doing it in a way that you won't have to go back and do that again um, to make it accessible in public. And so, you know, we use tools like GitHub where, you know, it could be already up on the on the web, um, you know, sort of from the beginning, people can make their repositories private as they're working on them and then public at the end. Um, so that's one way, but there are other people in our lab who kind of more prefer to do it at the end, you know, for us, the, the policy that we made, and again, I think this goes back to that thing of meeting each person where they are, you know, we have policies that everybody has to do, which is by the time your paper is accepted, you know, it needs to be up on our, um, archive, but we're, how you do that. And when it goes up is, is, you know, dependent for each person. Some people, when they're submitting it, which we're now starting to move um, forward to, when you're submitting your paper, 
um, for peer review that, uh, you know, all your code and data are, are up there. And by the way, I've noticed, you know, that can be really efficient because a lot of times we're, reviewers will look at that and that can make your paper go easier through the peer review process. So there is, you know, something related to that um, on there as well. Um, but, but again, I think it has to be like some specific guidelines, you know, here's what we do, here's how it is. And then also flexibility and understanding that different people will approach it in different ways. I think that's a lot of sense. And I, I really like the idea of having a, a lab wide policy and a timeline so that you can really plan ahead for these sorts of things and, and not, you know, go to submit your paper and all of a sudden find out that you need to pick a repository and submit to GitHub and all this other stuff. So that's great. Thank you, Elise. Uh, Oladipo, Kathleen, do you have any tips to share here? Uh, You're I, muted, Oladipo. You're still muted. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. No. Yeah, from the work that we've done um, uh, from previous experiences, I think the way we've been able to go around it is uh, using GitHub. So uh, for the particular project that we start, we have all the, 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 all the authors and the co-authors, we already have the repository where, of course, at, the, at that point, we may not make it public. It will be privately viewed among us. So we do all of the project development, all the coding, the visualization, everything right in GitHub. So it's already available then. There is always a guideline about how the code should be written so that it should be uh, descriptive. Uh, there should be um, a, a, at least as much as needed um, a comments so that each individual person who wants to review a, a part of the code understands what it does. So you, you would, uh, uh, if, uh, for example, like three of our four of us already are working with on a, uh, on a project and we have it already on the GitHub and all the four of us can are able to understand the, the fourth person is able to understand what the first person did. It means at the end of the day, when we put it out there, anybody who is uh, looking at the code can be able to understand the code once you are able to understand the I mean, the language uh, in which it is written. So, and it's also very easy for the review process because at the end of the day, when the uh, publication outlet is now asking for us to provide the data and the code, all we need to do is just uh, share either the link or we just archive it, the code and just send it. So it, that's the way uh, from practice one can go around it. Of course, there can be there are better. There might be a better way of going around it, but it's just the practical way we've been able to go around the project. No, I think that makes a lot of sense, and I really I I I love the idea of you know making sure that you know however many people are working on the code, they can all understand what everyone else has done which ultimately means that someone who's reusing your code will probably find it more useful too. I think that's another big issue here. As Elise mentioned, we can talk about sharing data and code. And for instance, at the American Geophysical Union, we can uh, measure you know, to some extent how much uptake our authors have in, in, in you know, sharing their data and software. What's harder for us to assess is how useful is what's being shared? How well documented is it? Uh, how complete is it? Um, and how useful is it to be reused in the community, which is ultimately one of our goals. And, uh, you know, Oladipo, you mentioned, okay, good, really good documentation is very important. Uh, I want to know uh, if, if you have any thoughts, uh, you, you all, all you panelists, on how we can promote good reusability. Is that the, uh, the onus on, at publication on the editors and the reviewers to make sure that what's being shared is, is good? Is that maybe more of an earlier cultural change among researchers? Uh, and what kind of policies do you think would help promote good reusability? Maybe I'll start and, and we can get, build on each other from here. Because I think Elise um, raised a really good point earlier when she said, just because something is published doesn't mean it's reusable, right? And other research has shown this also like in the space of data, of, of this more meta research, right? That just because something is available doesn't mean that even experts understand it if it doesn't have the necessary context and documentation. Um, so where that occurs, I think that occurs from the very beginning in these examples, like Oladipo and Elise are talking about having good documentation in the code. Uh, 
but also, and I know this is not necessarily the type of, of data that you're producing at AGU or the type of, type of data that my co-panelists are working with, I'd like to point out that this need for good data documentation is not just for large data sets that might be used to create a model. This is something that qualitative researchers who do interviews can also um, take advantage of to document, for example, their interview protocols. Even if they can't share their data, they can share this step of the data, right? Um, so that's not necessarily forwarding reuse, but it is a way of providing context. Um, but that's just the beginning, right? The, the person who creates the data just has the first stab at providing some of this documentation. And then at every layer of the process, the team, the the university, the, the journals, I think everyone else needs to have eyes on the documentation itself. Because I think that's really the key to assessing the data is what's in the in the documentation, in the descriptions, in the comments. But I'll pass it over to, to Elise and Olidapo. Maybe they have something to add there also. Well, I was just going to say, you know, what is the um, best motivation that I found for me in my lab is the fear of embarrassment, um, because I would say that the reason that I started getting into um, open science and realizing how important what is, is because one, you have to know that your future self is less knowledgeable. I won't use the word dumber, but less knowledgeable than your current self. And so one thing you're doing is you're making your life easier for your future self. Even you think like, oh, I've done this, you know, whatever I'm going to remember in three months when I need to do revisions on the paper. No, you don't. And students, you know, just they don't know that, right? They think they're going to remember, but you can kind of start to tell them like, oh yeah, this is what's going to be what happened. Do you want to keep good notes? And, you know, if you create that culture, I think in the lab or in the department, like then it's easier for other people to buy into it. But the other real reason for me is, you know, I've been embarrassed, like, uh, you know, the start early on that people have asked me like, oh, hey, you know, years after a paper is published, oh, hey, you know, how did you do this? What was this? And I'm like, you know, it's embarrassing, but I've been like, okay, I don't know, you know, um, this was early in my career, which is really what started, you know, making this um, archive was, was just to say, now, if someone asked me about a paper 10 years ago, I can say everything that we've got is up there. It should be everything, you know, but if it's not up there, I don't have anything else. Right. And, and then I don't have to say, how did you do this? How did you do that? Um, you know, it, it, it's a position no researcher wants to be in, you know, and I think maybe now it's a little bit acceptable still to just ignore those emails, which I do think happens, but, you know, we're moving more and more into this future where it's like, yeah, you can't really ignore that. Um, and so, uh, you know, you don't want to be in that position. And I, I do think, I do think it, it helps early, get people early in graduate school early when they're thinking about collecting data and doing analyses to understand, you know, what's the value. I mean, of course, you know, we want to be altruistic to everybody out there, but what's the value to yourself, you know? Um, and I think that can be a helpful motivator. I like that. So uh, we shouldn't be embarrassed to make mistakes, but we should be embarrassed to not share our data. <laughs> I like that. That's exactly how I think. We shouldn't be embarrassed to make mistakes. That happens. We shouldn't think about necessarily retracting papers, even for egregious ones, but we should feel bad about not being able to tell someone how we did what we did. Right. Um, so I, I think, yeah. I like that too. I never thought about it like that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, actually, the, the the great motivation for me um, to be able to put uh, proper documentation uh, for proper user uh, uh, reusability is uh, earlier earlier when I was undergraduate. You know, I I used to write uh, 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 embedded system programs for I mean for assembly language for embedded uh, systems. You know, of course, anybody who has written assembly language or know how tedious <laughs> assembly language is, um, uh, coupled with um, how tedious it, it is for to you for you to debug it. So, if, you, if for example, I intend to put, to do another project in which I need part of the initial previous project, then I started sitting down, uh, uh, spending hours trying to understand what I have done previously. <laughs> so. It, I mean, it, uh, it defeats the whole purpose if one is able to keep a, 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 um, a code that you've written in the, in the past. And now, even yourself have to spend hours trying to understand the code you've written before it is usable to you. Now, I just think about another person 
who, had, who, was not, who, has not, who was not even part of the entire process of development, how would the person would be able to even use it? If you yourself uh, is not able to use the code or finding it very difficult to be able to use the code, just uh, maybe barely one year after um, writing the code and saving it in the repository. So that became a, uh, a motivation for uh, actually wanting to put enough proper document, uh, I mean, codes and also some other material in uh, having proper documentation for them. So that number one, if I need to reuse them for another project, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Then if someone else needs it, if I can then read it, then it's also useful for someone else to be able to use it. They also don't have to reinvent the wheel. So they start off from, they are, they are able to start off from where I have stopped. Because uh, of course, uh, this may not be important for people, I just in quote, for people who have enough resources and enough time, those in the developed country, you know, you could have enough resources to be able to pull uh, information from a database somewhere or from a computer somewhere. But for us in the developing country, where even some of our uh, search results have been filtered, you know, the moment you are able to assess a particular information and you save it, you want to be sure that that information can be very useful to you and to those that are around you. Those one will be mentored in the course. It should be able to, it should be uh, useful to them. So this is, uh, this has been uh, a, a good motivation for, for me and those that I've worked with to be able to put out uh, our, our code out and properly documented and properly uh, um, saved. And, even uh, in terms of uh, even uh, the labels also, yeah, the titles, yeah. Maybe I think I it makes a lot of make... sense. Yeah, go ahead, Kathleen. So as, as a person who researches these practices, I can't quite take off that hat as I'm listening to our conversation, apologies. But one thing that I notice in, in the discussion that we're having here is how much of the discussion is revolving around processes. We're not talking about outputs. We're not talking about having a data set on a repository. We're talking about providing actually documentation and record of, of these processes of, of coding or of managing data and making that process more visible, right? So this I think is really the important bit that we need to think about as we move forward is how to think of data sharing as more of a process rather than as just the final output of putting something in, in a repository. And now I take my hat off and, and, and I'll stop <laughs> analyzing our conversation. <laughs> no, that's uh, that's so well put, Kathleen. Something, something, open science is a journey. We're studying the process of that journey. <laughs> um, Oladipo, I really liked your point too about, I, I wanna recognize this, that when you're sharing your code, you're not just uh, helping someone out there. You're helping yourself in the future, your future self, and you're helping your collaborators and you're helping your coworkers. So I think that was great. Um, I think that we're coming to the end of our question and answer time now. Uh, and thank you to all three of our panelists. Please everyone join me in thanking them for uh, sharing their views, their experiences, and some great future steps for us. <laughs> so thanks. That was a great session. Uh, so much to think about. And a huge thank you to all of our session one speakers. Um, and I once again want to have a big thank you to our sponsors, ACM, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, Silverchair, and STM. So we're now going to be on break for the next 10 minutes. But during that time, if you would, we'd love for you to participate in a short interactive survey on Menti. This will help inform the discussion for the next session. All you got to do is simply click on the link that Tara is about to post into the chat um, and uh, then we'll get started with that. There you go. So the first question that we had was how does your organization provide guidance on open research practices? Okay, not a surprising answer there. Yep. 
data editor is great. Okay, a loop guide, excellent. Any other thoughts on this? There we go. So more information in journals, not yet organized. Yeah, okay. An institute. Okay. Overall encouraging. Okay, great. Hmm. Webinars, website, occasional email, list post. Certainly more of that. Looks like lots of web pages being built. Service. Lots of good stuff for you, Shelly and Co. I, I'm, I'm appreciating this very much, Howard. All right, seeing if there's any more. Once, twice. All right, we're gonna move on to our next question. So what challenges have you seen adopting open research practices? I think we saw a question pop up in the Q&A before about that. Apparently it's easy. I know that's not true, folks. So what challenges have you seen? Time, resources. <laughs> okay, that goes back to fear of being wrong. Inter interesting, we, we saw that before, right? <clears throat> Value is always a big one. Time constraints again, standards. Different groups speaking different languages, sure. Yeah. Loss of control, ownership. So versioning and and what makes something complete, interesting. Time, culture, not knowing the benefits, sure. There's a theme there. <clears throat> no rewards. How to avoid the negative outcomes. That's an interesting one. So uh, other, jo other journals not requiring this and therefore they're easier to publish in. Balancing openness and patentability. Certainly we've heard that. Glad to see that on the list, this is important. All right, looks like that's probably our last answer for now. So thank you all for doing the poll. That was great. Hopefully Shelly and Co, you've got some ideas for your bit. Uh, I'm gonna go back here and we're gonna resume in just a few minutes.
All right, Shelly, we're gonna get started in about just about a minute. Great. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so I'm Shelley Stahl. I'm the Vice President of Open Science Leadership at the American Geophysical Union. I work with Christina Frauffenfelder, whom you uh, just had as your moderator. And I'm really excited about uh, the second half of the session. So uh, we, we began with getting the viewpoint of the researchers working within the labs, um, and I don't know if you noticed the Q and A that came in, uh, in, uh, into uh, that was sent in by the by the participants. Uh, but the question was, but listen, what happens if uh, the world that I'm working in sharing is not a good idea? It's actually frowned upon because um, that data uh, is my data. It's my data. Um, so let's let's dig into the kind of infrastructure that we need to help with that culture challenge, uh, which is very real and very uh, prolific quite all the way around the world. So here we have the support system uh, having to do with the value of open data sharing um, uh, and what that means within open science. And uh, as Elise was saying earlier, we really do need to understand that researchers are where they are in their evolution, their their journey in open science. And um, we just have to recognize that the cultures are very embedded. Um, so I would like to introduce to you our three panelists for this session. Uh, Danny Kincaid, she's a director of the Biological and Chemical Oceanography Data Management Office at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. She's also the president of uh, our AGU's informatics section. Uh, and I get a chance to work with Danny quite a lot. Uh, her work uh, exists at the intersection of research oceanography and data science, exploring the application of information technologies and best practices to the, uh, to the act of managing and reusing oceanographic data. She also works to build consensus within communities around uh, the practice of open science and fair principles. Um, and making sure that the needs of all stakeholders, as we as we've just explored in this first section, uh, are represented uh, in that work. Dr. Alan Pope, he's the program director of Polar Cyber Infrastructure at the National Science Foundation um, at Cambridge University. He received his PhD in remote sensing of glaciers, and prior to his role at the NSF. Alan supported the National Snow and Ice Data Center, and here he worked in remote sensing of the cryosphere, um, and examples of that include the development of applications of Landsat 8 uh, 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 data, estimating uh, superglacial lake depth with optical imagery, and studying glacier change on the western and Arctic peninsula. Um, so not only hands-on work, but also in his role now at the National Science Foundation. So I'm really glad that Alan's here. Um, and Lauren Kamek, she's the managing editor of Science Magazine. Uh, she attended Bucknell University studying chemistry, uh, moved into publishing uh, straight away at AAAS Science. She is the primary administrative officer of the science family of journals, working closely with their editors in chief and editors. She manages projects related to change in, changes in editorial policy and information technology. She oversees the copy editing of journal content, administration of these multiple journals, as well as science sponsored prizes. So think about the incentives that were brought up earlier um, and the need for those. So we, we have a connection here. Um, and she is uh, really the one who ensures that everyone who supports those journals maintains those high standards. And we recognize um, Science Magazine as having those high standards. Um, so I'm really glad that Lauren could be here. Um, if you could all come off 
uh, let's see, starting with Danny, um, if you could um, bring your video on, please. And Danny, I hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Shelley. Can you hear me? Indeed. Carry on. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me today and allowing me to speak on um, geoscience data repositories. As Shelley said, I'm the director and co-PI on a repository project that's funded by the National Science Foundation to help curate and publish the um, project output of their awardees in oceanography. Uh, next slide, please, Howard. Thanks. And what I hope to speak to you today about or leave you with the idea that repositories and more specifically disciplinary repositories, those that serve a particular community, um, fill a certain niche in this open science enterprise through their um, through their their reason d'etre for um, for curating and publishing um, open open data. And I'd like to specifically kind of drill into three particular roles. One is that um, repositories partner with the actual researchers, especially disciplinary repositories. And that's not only to educate them on better data hygiene and data management practices, but obviously we do the heavy lift of, of curating and then publishing those data in a way that's fair. And we'll dig into that in just a moment. Um, so, so that's really their heavy lift. But we also provide a glue to a research community in that we can help shepherd or steer data to um, from one particular research effort to all of its disciplinary repositories that need to do that curation. And then in a federated way, pull that data back together for um, reuse in a, a very holistic manner. And I'll, I can get into that in a little bit as well. And then lastly, repositories engage in this broader data publishing community to really um, drive effective data sharing uh, forward. And so I'd like to sort of dig into each one of these topics briefly and, um, and hopefully give you a, a, a holistic picture of what repositories can do for this, this sort of enterprise of open science. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things as a repository we find is that when researchers arrive to, to work with us, they're really, they're really um, our researchers in general are particularly driven by the need to satisfy funding requirements. So they don't fully appreciate the, um, the value um, that is provided by sharing their data, whether that's to them as an individual and they are satisfying their funded requirements, sure, but they're also getting credit for the hard work that they do. Um, citing your data or sharing your data can lead to increased citations and collaborations. Um, and then by contributing your data, you're, you're actually adding to a community resource that's available for reuse, you know, as, um, uh, Elise was talking about that going forward, reuse of data is really going to be, um, you know, a, a, a active, valuable piece to the to to the research process. Especially in oceanography, um, we're seeing more modeling going on, reuse of data. So contributing your data actually contributes to that to that broader community resource. It also enables transparency of results for peer review, um, and then at a societal level. That transparency can boost public confidence in the scientific process. Your data can go on to contribute to um, resource management and policy efforts, and then it's just accessible to the to the public and to education. So really, kind of pushing that that value to the researcher to educate them on that. Um, next slide, please. And then once they understand that, um, you know, contrary to what Elise was talking about, a lot of a lot of folks that come to us they're not aware of how to share their science, uh, how to share their data. Um, we're gonna do it for them. And they they really can't do this alone. Uh, a lot of folks can't do this alone. And, and really for those of you who are familiar with the word FAIR, making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, um, you might recall that the FAIR principles apply not only to making those data FAIR for human use, but also for machine use. And there are very few researchers who could, in and of themselves, make their data fair for um, automated workflows and computer analyses. So really, the, the repository needs to help the researcher do this. And, and we use uh, 
technologies and best practices, leading practices to be able to do this. Um, so, so really helping them go that extra mile to get their data to a reusable and interoperable state. Next slide, please. And so in, in my field, um, being able to do that on the repository side is incredibly challenging. Um, and that's because oceanographic data and like other geoscience data are incredibly complex. Um, they're heterogeneous and uh, they can be quite large. And from an infrastructure standpoint, that poses a lot of challenges to be able to help the researcher um, make those data fair, not only in the human readable form, but also in the machine actionable form. And what this slide demonstrates is um, just a snapshot of the repository that I'm affiliated with. It represents data that are comprised or are a result of all the oceanographic subdisciplines from biology to geophysics. Um, the collection types vary greatly. Each collection type or data type has its own format that might be unique to a type, but may also be unique to a community. The scale at which they are contributed varies greatly from microbial to megafauna and synoptic large coverage to very discrete slices of the ocean. And, um, and then there are added challenges with community accepted um, vocabularies and variable amounts of metadata. Uh, it's it's quite a, a large endeavor um, for a repository to to be able to um, steward such heterogeneous content. Um, next slide, please. And we do this by starting with the individual and um, the individual resource researcher, and we typically do this uh, by approaching them or they approach us. Um, as early as possible. I know we were talking about, and Elise mentioned, you know, a practice that she's trying to instill is have their researchers by the time you're ready to publish to have shared your data. And we try and work with researchers much earlier than that and stay with them throughout that entire data life cycle. So at the time of proposal, we provide guidance on data management planning and how to format and um, any standards that are available. We help, um, we help consult them on improving data quality and interoperability. Um, and then when they contribute those data, we capture very rich metadata necessary for reuse and understanding for peer review. Um, we ultimately will quality control those data. We will um, publish them out with the appropriate licensing. We also um, provide recommended citations for those data. Then ultimately we provide obviously access to all the data information, related information and metadata. And we track the usage of those data for um, attribution to the PI. And then finally, we ensure long-term archive at the appropriate archive in, uh, in, for example, our instance, that's the National Oceanographic Archive in the US here. And that ensures that the data will live on even if the repository as a research project goes and, and is sunsetted in, in for any reason. Um, so really working with them throughout that whole data life cycle to educate them on how to share their data more effectively in the future, but then providing that heavy lift of publishing the data for them. Next slide, please. And so as, as uh, this glue in the community, repositories can also help um, steward data that need to be curated in other repositories. So for example, on the left of side of this slide, there's one research cruise that goes off with say a number of, of um, scientists and their projects may take a wide suite of data that ultimately should be best curated in domain or disciplinary specific repositories. Um, and they're tasked with trying to best steward that and so we at the at the at Bico Demos repository, we help them find the appropriate repository, say for their genomics data or their physical samples. And we can help them uh, ensure that the holistic picture of their project output is best curated in the appropriate repositories. Then on the discovery side, um, when a new researcher comes to a repository, we can use technologies to federate content in distributed locations. And what that basically means is somebody can seamlessly discover data at Bico Demo that resides in other repositories. 
that provide a holistic picture of the research that went off at that particular cruise. Um, so we, we, we function as this, this glue for the research community. Um, next slide, please. And then lastly, from the broader perspective of the data publishing ecosystem, repositories can sit at this really unique spot that, um, that is at the center of, of the broader effort. So we can engage with funders to ensure that um, compliance to data sharing happens and, um, and also ease the burden of data sharing for the rewardees. We obviously partner with the individual researcher, but also um, larger uh, communities of practice and societies to help drive best practices and standards that ultimately will feed back into more effective data sharing. We partner with journals to provide the data that are um, underpinning the scholarly publication. Um, and just generally can, can help uh, drive the practice of open data and sharing um, forward. And so um, let, next slide, please. If I leave you with, you know, with one sentiment that ties it all together, it's that repositories, specifically domain repositories that have the expertise to, to really well curate those data for the interoperability and the reusability of FAIR, we, we will relieve the researcher of all those really challenging um, aspects of data sharing. We educate them in better data hygiene and data management practices that help them improve their own processes. And in the ensuing time or all the while, we're contributing to a re rich resource that sort of feeds the, um, the scientific endeavor. And so really that's all I have for you. Um, and I really look forward to the questions in the Q&A. Thanks so much. Danny, thank you so much. Um, very exciting. Um, Alan, we, are you ready to go? Yeah, I am here. So hopefully you can hear me. Yes, you sound great. Carry on. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Alan. I'm a program officer at the National Science Foundation. I'm in the Office of Polar Programs, but I work in the Directorate for Geosciences. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the value of open data and software sharing is um, coming at least from my role at NSF. Um, kind of giving some examples of different uh, programs that support open data and software, uh, and each of which kind of has a different flavor of where they see the benefit there, and then uh, finish off with a, a few thoughts uh, at the end. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so a lot of you might have noticed if you're uh, keeping an eye on what's coming out of the, the US federal government uh, and from NSF in particular, that there is a growing importance of open, accessible, and reproducible science at NSF and across all government supported science. You might have seen uh, this memo from the Office of Science and Technology Policy about uh, ensuring free, immediate, and equitable access to federally funded research. I think that's kind of a baseline for a lot of uh, the work that NSF does, uh, especially coming from the geo world. It's definitely more of a baseline than, than a, a new higher bar. Um, there's this FAIR RCN, so uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and open science research coordination networks. Um, I hope you love all of these acronyms as much as, as we do, um, but that program is supporting different uh, ways to bring scientists together to, to share how they are doing at their open science and making their, their data and code uh, more fair. Uh, and then there's also this uh, reprodu reproducibility and replicability DCL uh, that you can see here on the right. Uh, DCL is a dear colleague letter. It's just another way for NSF to, to get its news out there. Um, and that also highlights some opportunities to, to support uh, open science. And in case you haven't heard, you probably all have, but 2023 is our federal year of open science. Uh, I'm just speaking from NSF. You can see what a bunch of different other government agencies are doing at open.science.gov. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so within GEO or the Geosciences Directorate, we have this cyber infrastructure working group. Uh, and some of the goals of that working group are to obviously advance geoscience research to promote openness and participation through open science, and uh, specifically to pursue AI and ML innovation in the geoscience. It's kind of a, a subset, of the, the niche there of our CI group. But you can see here that, that our open science cyber infrastructure, cyber infrastructure goals are not decoupled from our, our 
disciplinary geoscience goals. We see those two things as interlinked and moving forwards together. Uh, and the other theme that you'll see here is that we're talking about promoting broader participation through open science. And that's a, a key theme that we see in a lot of these open science programs throughout NSF is that by opening how we do our science, we're inviting more people into that science, at least we're hoping to. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and just in case you're you're curious, uh, this was for federal year 2023, but, but this geo cyber program, um, this was the requested budget was, was around $20 million specifically on geo cyber infrastructure. Who knows what the 24 budget will be? We'll see. But the point is there that this is a cross cutting activity across all of geo um, and also across other parts of NSF. So in addition to disciplinary investments, we're seeing these open science investments that cross different disciplines and with the goal to help bring those disciplines working together more as well. So another benefit of open science is hopefully more interdisciplinary science as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we, I'm, I'm coming from a geoscience perspective, but one of the things we explicitly do is work with our Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure to provide funding for more uh, open science and cyber infrastructure. Uh, I won't go through all of these in particular, but I'll say that we have a few different programs, whether you're focusing on um, particular CI and unblocking or overcoming particular barriers, whether you're looking at building capacity and training, whether we're exploring this world of cyber infrastructure professionals um, and, and enhancing not just grad students that are able to do this work, but professionalizing this work and saying, what does that look in the long term? How is that sustainable? Uh, and then there are a range of different um, computing opportunities that are available, whether it's uh, high performance computing, high throughput computing or cloud services. Uh, and all of this information is available at the GeoCI page uh, that NSF maintains. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and in case you're wondering like, okay, where, where does my research, where does my open science fit? Um, this is a little bit of a, a matrix that you can use. Again, I'm hoping some of these are gonna be shared afterwards. This is for you to, to reference. I'm not gonna talk through each square individually, but um, the overarching point here is that programs each have specific purposes, but they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Please feel free to reach out to particular NSF program officers, put together a paragraph or a one pager that says, this is what I wanna do. You know, This is why I think it's important send that, have that conversation with your program officer, and then the two of you can help uh, or can figure out where your fit might be, uh, where, where the, the program or the, the proposal you're, you're proposing, where it would fit the best. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is just an example of, of what we like to think of as highly accessible resources or open resources for, for doing, um, for, for computing across the, the country that NSF supports. Uh, next slide, please. I also want to emphasize, you know, I talked about research within geosciences, and I'll come back to that. Um, I talked about our Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure Computing. You know, when we think about open science, there's that computing component. Um, but we also have this new directorate within NSF, new uh, within the last couple of years, TIP, the Technology Innovations and Partnerships Directorate, uh, that also wants to support open science and wants to support cyber infrastructure to facilitate our science. Uh, and I guess I'm talking about CI specifically because I, I didn't say this explicitly, um, that I think the two are, are uh, intimately related and inextricable really. If we're talking about how we do our open science, then cyber infrastructure underpins that, facilitates it and makes it happen. Um, so yeah, should have said that more clearly at the beginning. Um, there are a few different programs working towards open science that, that TIP is running. Um, I would say keep an eye on this space. Everything, I know, I know the, public uh, plans for TIP or for it to like keep doubling for a couple of years. It's supposed to be getting much, much bigger and working more across NSF as well. So keep an eye out on what opportunities are available from TIP, whether that's things like the Convergence Accelerator to work across different uh, disciplines, whether that's the Innovation Core to think about how you find other users or build community, find buy-in from other uh, groups to, to support your your science, um, as well as this pathways to enable open source ecosystems. Um, how do we enable open source software or hardware, both 
are, are, are under this program, um, but what programs are there to support open source uh, activities? Uh, yeah, and next slide, please. So within GEO, um, I wanna highlight this program in particular, the GEO Open Science Ecosystem Program. Um, it's a new solicitation this year. Uh, it's the follow-on from EarthCube, which many of you might be familiar with, um, that supports improvement and democratization of access to open science resources within the geoscience, with a focus on increasing access to data, physical collections, software, computing, and more. Uh, and I'm highlighting this in particular because we had a lot of inquiries about, um, hey, does this fit? Does that fit? Does that fit? Uh, and one of the things we would say to people was, you know, this isn't just about supporting open science. All of our programs, our disciplinary programs should be supporting open science. This is supporting people and supporting projects that facilitate and support open science. Um, so that next level of support, because I think Danny really highlighted a lot of these skill sets to make our data and code open are specialized. Uh, and so we want to make sure we're supporting um, the community in building the support system to be able to do that open science. Um, and you'll see that emphasis on democratization there. Again, this is about broadening participation, broadening or increasing accessibility of, of our science by doing open science. If you're in particular geoscience, I'll highlight the geoinformatics program, our polar cyber infrastructure program, um, and disciplinary programs within AGS and OCE as well. Next slide, please. Um, I wanna highlight Polar in particular because that's the community that I come from. We have a, a dear colleague letter that came out recently about supporting open Polar research software that was following on from a new, uh, a new code policy or data and code policy that came out last year that was including code in our definition of what we were requiring to make open uh, through our data management plans. Um, and so that program invites, or sorry, that DCL invites sustainable development and use of open source software um, by say building upon, um, like I said, building upon this recently updated data policy, whether that is things like upgrading, translating, documenting better, building community, training, building capacity, all of these things uh, that help support open science. You know, this is one example within Polar, but there are other similar sorts of things happening across the foundation. Uh, and again, the idea here is about increasing accessibility and inclusivity and impact of the science that we're doing. Uh, next slide. So I'll finish up with a few thoughts. You know, we had that question at the beginning, right, about open and science, is it binary or not? No. Obviously, I think we, we've heard of that uh, repeated. Um, but what I have seen is that at, in a few different disciplinary communities, I think we see a lot of people who are all in on open data, working on doing that. And I think there is movement towards making software more open, that one is the stepping stone to the other, even though making our software more open, documented, usable, facilitates the use of our data. And so the two are, are really mutually reinforcing. And so we hope to support the community in, in doing both to, to advance both goals together. Um, I also wanna emphasize that software is people too. Uh, sorry, and cyber infrastructure is people too. Open science is people, is the capacity to do that open science. It's not just the tools to do so. And so training is a big part of any program that, that we run. And it's about building, a, a, I guess, multifaceted uh, future science workforce, right? We know that not everyone stays in academia and that's great because they have these open science skills that they can bring to other parts of, of our um, economy and workforce in the future. Uh, you'll see this in a lot of places, but if you build it and they will come, it is no longer good enough for open science. Um, we wanna build adaptable workflows. We wanna have particular use cases that, that are identified so that we know these tools are gonna get used but that then other groups can also learn from. Uh, and that's one of those other benefits of doing our science more open is that we can translate lessons from some communities to other communities to, to really make the most of those investments. Um, and what does sustainability look like? I think that's a question we're all asking, we're all uh, exploring, um, but I will emphasize that NSF can only fund what gets proposed. And so we need to see these uh, ideas, questions, proposals that come from the research community. And, and really it is, I, I know that, that the research community often says, well, I can only submit what NSF puts out there. Well, 
we also can only fund what, what comes to us um, and what gets reviewed well, Emph emphasis on, on reviews being really important, um, but that I think it really is the community that pushes NSF uh, in, in particular directions as well. And so I wanted to finish on that note. Um, so thank you so much for the, the time and opportunity and I look forward to questions at the end. Alan, thank you so much. So uh, we've heard from Danny, who's talked about repositories where your data can be made open and available in partnership. And we've talked to Alan, who is helping us to fund the work, fund the research, fund the new ideas. And so now let's talk about publishing the research uh, itself. So Lauren, are you ready? Hi. Great. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Lauren Kinnick, Managing Editor of Science. And today I will be mainly offering the journal perspective on data and software sharing, both broadly and with a more specific focus on some recent developments in the science family. Uh, just a quick note before I dive in, my talk will largely focus on data, but the overall message generally applies to software, to software and code sharing as well. Next slide. So many different groups have issued recommendations pertaining to open data. Some are broad in scope. For instance, we have the FAIR principles, with which I imagine at least some of this group is well acquainted. Uh, we've also got the top guidelines, another general set, which I will say more about momentarily. And then there are a wealth of discipline-specific recommendations. The MIBBI guidelines listed here are just one example for the life sciences, but there are several others. So we have all of these guidelines, but what level of familiarity do authors have? Well, it often varies quite a bit depending on their field of expertise and level of experience. Even if authors are very familiar with the accepted standards for their field, publishing in a multidisciplinary journal may bring requirements that extend beyond what they know. And in that regard, publishers have a responsibility to both emphasize open data principles and provide clear guidance for authors. So the quote shown here is actually from an eight-year-old science article that still has quite a bit of relevance today. Uh, and this article, which focused on promoting a culture of open research, introduced the Transparency and Openness Promotion Act, or the top guide. Next slide, please. So let's take a brief historical look at the top. In 2014, with funding from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, Former science editor-in-chief Marsha McNutt oversaw a collaborative reproducibility workshop that included journal editors, disciplinary experts, and funder representatives. The group's goal was to formulate shared standards of, for open practice across journals. And out of this effort, the top guidelines were born. So this slide shows part of a table from the 2015 science article that introduced these recommendations. And although this is only part of the table and it's not an exhaustive picture of the guidelines, the chart here does give us a flavor of what the guidelines are and uh, various levels of compliance. As you can see, emphasis was placed on transparency and robust citations, all for the greater purpose of open science and reproducibility. So a year after TOP went public, more than 500 journals had at least begun to implement the guidelines. And although I don't have the count for the present day, I expect that the number has grown since then. Next slide, please. Shifting our focus now to repositories, this graphic is from an analysis of repository use by science authors in 2020. The repository landscape is quite large and ever expanding. So authors may face uncertainty when they attempt to publish their work. Many repositories like PDB and GenBank are field specific. And authors are generally familiar with the ones most common in their field. But what if a study, and by extension, its data set, spans multiple disciplines or doesn't otherwise fit into an existing category? Well, there are a number of general repositories, two of the most well known ones that I can see. But how can authors determine which is the best fit for their data? And we also need to think here about data retention policy. Certain repositories, such as GitHub, allow authors to alter or even remove files which could have the unintended consequence of hindering reproducibility. And at science, I can tell you that the vast majority of author questions that we receive about our data requirements pertain to data sets that lack a corresponding field-specific repository. 
So these issues have been at the forefront of our mind. Next slide, please. Okay, so all of this begs the question of whether there can and perhaps even should be stronger relationships and more intentional collaborations between journals and repositories. There are obvious benefits, such as quality control and data curation, ensuring that data sets are machine readable, robust metadata, a permanent and permanently accessible home for data, and proper citations and licensing. So these things clearly strengthen the connection between the article and its data set and promote discoverability and reuse. But there's also another benefit, namely facilitating peer review of data, arguably the next frontier in open research. Next slide, please. So now I'd like to share what the science journals are doing to support authors in this landscape and enable peer review of data. For several years, we have required data and code to be publicly and immediately available and properly cited with a DOI or other persistent identity. Just last month, we announced an exciting new partnership with Dryad in an effort to lower financial barriers to data deposition and facilitate peer review of data sets. Dryad's platform is now integrated with the Science Family Submission Portal, which means that authors can send data to Dryad directly from the portal when submitting to any one of the journals in our portfolio. Next slide, please. The positive impacts of this collaboration include making data seamlessly and privately available to editors and reviewers. An important data curation service that Dryad staff performs to check deposits for validity, organization, readability, and even reduce potential. And finally, no cost to authors. Science journals will be covering the cost of data publication for accepted papers. And the quote we have on this slide is from a recent science editorial announcing the Dryad partnership. And I like it because it highlights the communal nature of maintaining integrity in the scientific record. To that end, we are very optimistic that our relationship with Dryad will simplify data deposition for authors, promote reproducibility, and encourage collaboration across the scientific enterprise. Next slide, please. So zooming out again, beyond just the science journals, I want to talk briefly about translating overarching principles to daily practice. Efforts to shape policies that will benefit the scientific community are typically well publicized, but a lot of behind the scenes work is also required for smooth implementation. So to illustrate this concept, this is, here is the generic example of software reference and three form. At the top, we have a quite bare bones citation provided by an author. The middle example is the full text, full text citation after copy editor has gotten their hands on it. And just an aside here, copy editors do typically use reference processing software to make their lives easier, but even the very best reference processing software is not perfect. So some degree of manual work is probably involved and that might be adding each and every author name, the version number for the data set or some other part of the citation. And finally, we have full citation in JAPS XML format. The whole thing here is tagged as a software citation and each individual component is also correctly identified and tagged. Valid, uh, valid excuse me, well-formed XML such as this is necessary for optimal machine readability and processing from downstream indexers. Next slide, please. So it should come as no surprise then that improved citation practices result in better allocation of credit, which ultimately drives reuse and reproducibility. And all stakeholders have a role to play, whether they're researchers, publishers, repository personnel, or perhaps even standard organizations. On that note, I'll end with a brief plug for Jats for R, a community group of volunteers that develops XML tagging recommendations to enhance the reuse of scholarly content. The work of this group includes, but is certainly not limited to, recommendations for data and software citations. These recommendations are typically even vetted by NISO. So if you have questions about best practices for tagging your content, Jats for R is an excellent resource for you. Next slide, please. And that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Please feel free to reach out if you'd like to chat further. Thank you, Lauren. That's that's absolutely wonderful. 
Um, Lauren's team has been uh, critical on some really forward motion uh, in making machine readability of data and software citations um, understandable broadly for all disciplines. Just recently, we have a new publication out on that. So that, that has been incredible, incredible help. All right, so for our participants, if you could please put your questions into the Q&A, that would be fantastic. Um, and um, Howard, if you don't mind, uh, there we go. Thank you so much. Um, and if Danny, there, Alan, Danny, if you could come on camera, please. So I, I'd like to talk to you about persistent identifiers, just because it's one of my favorite subjects. And Danny mentioned uh, in her talk about the fact that well-documented data also means that that data is machine actionable, machine readable. And um, that means that, uh, you know, there's so much out there. Many researchers are using tools to find, discover, understand, and interrogate data. And a lot of those tools require that the, um, the access uh, and information about the data is uh, readable, understandable by the tools they're using. Um, so, uh, if you could all kind of think think in your mind, uh, what what does it mean to have the right persistent identifiers, Danny? This is a this is a softball for you. Uh, can you talk about what that means at Bico Demo when people submit their data? What what is that for a persistent identifier for you? Well, so as a repository, um, we love persistent identifiers. Persistent identifiers are like the the it makes our lives easy it's sort of the bread and butter of how we connect distributed content so persistent means that they're governed they're they are immutable in time and i the identifiers can represent bits of information that are unique to the full picture so we give our data um a single BOI, digital object identifier, that in and of itself is minted and governed by an organization that will steward that content. But as a repository, we leverage so many other PIDs, persistent identifiers. Um, there are, uh, in oceanography, um, we can ensure authoritative sources of the information by using persistent identifiers for content like a funder, for NSF, um, an individual using their ORCID, their Open Researcher ID, yet another persistent identifier. Um, we curate content um, associated with cruises, and there is an organization that will provide a, a cruise as an event with an identifier. And that means that all of this content is immutable, persistent, and we can reference it. And so it is, it is a great tool. They're great tools as a, as a repository manager and an information manager um, to leverage in, in pulling content together or dereferencing content and um, identifying those authoritative sources of content. I don't know if that, does that help answer that question or maybe that is it's, the jumping off point. It's a little bit in the weeds. I know I, I kind of started with sort of a really deep, but I think when we talk about open science, we talk about science that can be actually touched, read, experienced. And one of the ways we do that is um, through uh, tools that make that make the science uh, findable. And those can be search tools. So think, think Bing, mm -hmm. think Google, think other things. And one of the things that a persistent identifier does is push that the information, the discovery information to those tools. And you as you Bigodemo, not only do that for your data, but then you help that particular object be connected through those persistent identifiers to all the, to all the rest. That's right. That's right. They provide a, a, you know, sort of the glue to be able to connect uh, distributed information. Yeah. So, so if I were to infer, and I'm, I'm, I'm queuing up Alan and Lauren, just so they're getting ready. <laughs> if I were to infer um, when, when you register data that in fact, although it is making it open, but it's also identifying that that data was created by those authors and it's establishing a moment in time in a scientific record. That's exactly right. Yeah, it makes yep. it immutable, and and then it will be be able to be versioned and versioned and versioned and and yep. certainly referenced in such a way. Yeah. Yep. So so if anybody's like freaking out that oh my gosh what if something's wrong with my data, you know what we know that we know that data evolves, we know that mistakes are made, we know that you may 
uh, want to adjust a particular way of saying things, and that's all built into the system. So you can, in fact, do that. Yeah, and, and just building on that, I'll, I'll say that's why it's great to see these disciplinary repositories who, one, really know how to handle their community's data, but two, it's great to be able to encourage the research community to build a relationship with those data managers, right, who can give advice, who can give expertise, so you're not just leaving that data publication to the very last step before publication, or whether it's that, or submitting your annual report to, or final report to NSF, right, if you talk to them when you wrote your data management plan, updated records throughout the course of your award, and then you're coming to the end of your science and, and then you're working with them. It's no longer scary. You're not rushing and and it's building that into part of process. Um, and, and I think that point about like doing your future self that favor, yeah, it's you, but also you're doing future scientists of anyone, of any stripe, you know, that that favor of of working with them along the way uh, as well, and that's where this this concept of whether it's a DOI or some other appropriate persistent identifier. You know, I don't think we're going to have DOIs for all of our software. For example, um, there will be other DOIs and or sorry, other PIDs, but that's okay. Um, it's important to have them so that you can find them that that stuff down the line. So that when it's cited, because. I know people who mean so well when they say, just ask me and I'll provide the data or like, oh, it's it's just available on our university server. That's no problem. And it's like, I know you mean well. I am not imputing your intention, just that experts have said that that is not going to work out as well as you think that it might in the long term. So do the entire research community a favor and get those persistent identifiers for whatever type of, of product that is down the line. So Ellen, let me let me jump on that. So so here we are. We we've we've made a relationship, hopefully, between our researcher and the the best possible repository for their data. Now they're trying to decide um, when should I engage? Like when should I start to think about? And and let's let's use our optimal situation. So so let's guide uh, the folks that are per, are listening to us away from generalist repositories that provide no support, right? So uh, we they have a role in our, our world, but let's let's talk more about the kind of repository that Danny has. Um, and and so um, uh, if you're, uh, do you wanna take it from there, Alan, or shall I keep queuing you up? Well, I was gonna say, if you're within polar sciences, then like we have this data policy that will direct you to a resource page that says, hey, here's a list of, of potential repositories, go explore it and see which one makes the most sense for you. Talk to them, do it early, do it often, do it while you're writing your data management plan. Um, I'm seeing thumbs up. Danny, did you wanna say something else in there? <laughs> I love that, I love that language. I would say even when it gets time to, you've reached out to your domain repository, but even as you're, you know, share, share often, share early. I mean, it, it, domain curation is, is a heavy lift. It isn't just, you know, dropping it somewhere, getting your DUI and going. It's, um, it's really extracting um, not just the discovery level metadata, that metadata that helps people find, find your data, but it's the, it's the in the weeds. We can't help but get in the weeds, Shelley. Um, it, we we dig down into that really robust and rich metadata that allows those data to be reused. And, um, you know, uh, I know Elise had said, well, one of the reasons people don't share is they're afraid of they're afraid of finding mistakes. Um, but your repository, especially disciplinary repository, can be your best friend there, not only in the in the information but in the data itself. Um, and and they have oh, okay. applications. Yeah, yeah. You do a quality check. You actually we do a quality check on and behalf of the researcher before it gets published. That's correct. And we don't publish it without. It's a collaborative, iterative effort. Um, but we also have policies and procedures in place that allow those data to be embargoed before the publication. So if you are worried about um, either uh, early use or you know misuse your dis disciplinary repository can can really help mitigate that. So I wanna just kind of give a shout out, like make the connection early, share early, share often, because it really does take time. And if you come to a disciplinary repository after, um, you know, peer review is done and they're asking for, you know, they've, they're asking for the data set DOIs, it, it really taxes and stresses that system 
to be able, if everybody came and the night before they needed their data set DOI, their persistent identifier, it would really bog, bog everything down. So, you know, sharing early and working with your repository on QC and embargo if necessary is really a way to streamline that scholarly publication workflow as well. So, so before we bring in our actually peer review person um, for, for the actual paper, Danny, if you were to recommend for not just Speaker Duma, but other discipline repositories, what does the relationship life cycle look like? Like, how is that different than a, like a, a quick two seconds Zenodo upload? Well, so I gave a slide that had that, that data management life cycle. And we really, um, by partnering with our funder, with, with, you know, the geoscience directorate um, and specifically the, the oceanographic program managers that we work with, we can guide um, guide their awardees to us early. We reach out and register information about their projects so their projects discoverable. And then as they generate data, we've really worked with them to ensure that those people are um, pushing data out sort of on an annual basis with their report writing um, that allows the repository to have enough time to curate those data and work with the PIs um, so that by the time they are ready for, for scholarly publication, their data, they have their data set DOIs. Um, so we really work closely with NSF on trying to steward that, um, you know, hopefully it's a carrot and we make it really easy on our side and it's not a stick, but, um, you know, the, the, the relationship will continue and hopefully they have it, you know, the, the researchers when they get awarded again will know the process and and hopefully appreciate the process. Um, but yeah, we start at proposal. We provide guidance for people on filling out their data management plan. And we've even created a template for oceanography uh, awardees that is um, in compliance with what NSF is looking for. And that's available at the California Digital Library. So there are resources that hopefully will make that you know, data stewardship on before it arrives at the repository much easier. So, so think about your um, your researchers, your community. Well, what would be your oldest relationship with a researcher? Like, like how long have they been working with you closely? Oh well, we have researchers. So Pico Demo is um, uh, pushing seventeen years old, and so we've had researchers who are still working with us today since its inception. Yeah. So it is a long-term relationship. Okay. It's so, a long-term relationship. It works. It works. Uh, so, so Lauren, um, connecting the dots. So you now have the excited researcher who's ready to publish. They have something amazing that is, yeah, you'll clearly select for Science Magazine. Mm -hmm. And now what, what sort of experience do they have with your data and software policies? What is it that they need to do? So our requirements are that the, the data and code and anything that was essential to the work needs to be not only either part of the paper or preferably housed in an either discipline specific or general archive, um, but it needs to be available at the time of publication. It needs to be cited in the paper with a persistent identifier. And, you know, we don't limit folks to one data set. I mean, a, a paper might have a handful, um, depending on what, you know, what the study is. And as long as they are cited in the paper with the persistent identifier, they will become part of the downstream delivery and hopefully spurn more citations and reuse. And, you know, that it's a kind of a slow, slow progress, but uh, we're getting there. We're excited about what's been done so far. We are getting there. And I, I think if I could maybe add a little bit more words to what you've just said, that okay. because you've taken the time to apply the, the best practices, JATS for R, the coding, the machine actionable portion of what you're doing is giving life to that data citation such that it's linked to the paper, credit, go, credit, credit goes to the authors, the creators of that data, of that software, and it's um, either used or reused. Um, it's now recognized as its own research product connected to the paper you've just published. Um, and it it's it's a it's a contribution to the scientific record. It is, um, Alan. Over to you. I 
you, I believe NSF has now for some time recognized data sets as being a legitimate contribution. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Data sets are 100% something that we encourage people to put on their bio sketches so that people are seeing not just contributions, you know, in publication record, but also all of these other research artifacts are seen as um, research outcomes. And it provides that record so that when someone says, oh, yeah, I'm going to share my data and do this thing, it's a way for reviewers to also evaluate follow through on previous data management plans and things like that. Um, so you can see if they they have that skill set to, to do what they say they're going to do. To do what they say they're going to do so that they actually know what those things are. So I, 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 want, I know that we have a number of fear factors that our researchers have around this. The, the word scoop is on the tip of people's minds. They, I doubt anyone has actually, uh, I do say, okay, there is a Q&A. Um, uh, I doubt that anyone has, um, will say that openly here, but I'll say it for them. Um, if I publish my data right now, uh, my paper, I'm not ready yet, um, but uh, uh, what does that mean? Um, and I think ethically, when you when you publish, you are identifying the fact that you are associated with the creation of this data, and it's just like somebody taking somebody else's research. It is ethically wrong, and we do have standards in place that identify that. Um, and I think if if you know, I think you would all nod your heads that that is improper behavior. And so this concern around scooping walks someone who did the wrong thing into the ethical steps that we all have, the ethical code of conduct. AGU has, I know science has, and NSF, I'm sure you have it as well, that is wrong. And so that worry um, does have the backing of our respective organizations to say, no, that is wrong. And we won't, we will take the steps to correct it. Well, and we can think both about carrots and sticks, and it's important to have those sticks. But if you put the carrot out there too, like you are also the most expert in whatever data set or software you are sharing. And it's going to be much easier for someone to say like, hey, can we work together on this thing? Can we build a new collaboration? And so you're you're putting out you know offers of collaboration out there so that we have a more um, connected and cooperative research community. Um, so that that's part of visioning of, of where we want to go with that. So yes, there is a kind of protection from protective aspect, but also a kind of aspirational aspect. And I'm always an optimist, so I like to emphasize that. You know, I, I should have led with that. I should have led with that. But I wanted to, I know we're at the top of our hour. Um, and so we'll we'll close out here in just a couple minutes. Um, but I, I wanted to make sure that we got it. I, we have it in the recording. Everyone knows what is, you know, a, a scientific record product is important. Data set, software, publication, um, they are all important. So, uh, and that that is absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, I think we are coming to a close and uh, I have so many more questions that I would love to ask, but we have run out. So we uh, maybe there'll be another opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Alan. Um, and thank you, Lauren. And to all of our speakers, um, uh, Elise and Moomin and Kathleen, uh, I think you heard many connections into the challenges that researchers have with our with the second half of the of the forum. And Howard and Tara, thank you both for hosting us here. So you're very welcome. Um, I thought it was a great session today. Um, and I hope you all found the sessions very interesting and informative. We're going to be sharing the video and the presentations in a few days. So um, if you want to find out more about the course events, there's the URL, which I'm sure Tara will put into the chat. And uh, enjoy the rest of your week. And thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Shelley.